Good morning, everybody, and welcome to our Sunday morning worship service. This is an opportunity for us as, as a church to worship the Lord and to lift up our hearts and our hands before His throne of grace. And as we lift up our praise to Him, the windows of heaven will open and the presence of God will come down into our lives. So there's so much to be grateful for despite the COVID situation and the difficulties that we face many times. But still in the midst of it all, we can offer unto Him the sacrifice of praise. And so I want to encourage you today to, to give your heart in praise to God. And no matter what you're going through, understand that God is with us. And because He's with us, we can cope better with our circumstances and situation. God will bring us through, that's for sure. We continue to trust in Him and to lean on Him and He will never fail us. Let's pray. God, our loving Father, we are so grateful to You for Your amazing love in our lives. Through all this difficulty, through all the storms, we thank You that You are forever faithful. This has been our experience, Lord. Your, your presence has comforted us. The assurance of Your promises has given us strength, Lord. And God, today we bring to you our praise and our offering as an offering. We bring to you, you our worship because only you are worthy to be praised. And we ask that as we lift up our hearts and our voices before you as a church, that you'll receive our praise, Lord. God, we commit the service into your loving hands. Be thou glorified in our midst. Let your presence come into every home, I pray, Lord. Let your presence fill every life, Lord. In Jesus' precious and holy name we pray. Amen. Amen. Let's sing, My life is in you, Lord. My life is in you, Lord. My strength.
seated on the throne. Your name is above every other name, Lord. At the name of Jesus, every knee will bow, Lord. At the name of Jesus, every tongue will confess that Jesus is Lord. And Father, today, we bow our knee before you in worship as we declare that you are our Lord and Savior. Precious Jesus, we love you, Lord. We love you, Lord Jesus. Jesus, Sweetest name of all, Jesus, you always hear me when I call. Oh, Jesus, you pick me up each time I fall. You're the sweetest, sweetest name of all.
precious Jesus. Lord, we worship you, Jesus. We bless your name, Lord. You are worthy of every praise, Lord Jesus. Holy art thou, o Lord, King of kings and the Lord of lords. We worship you, Jesus. We worship you, Lord. We worship you, Jesus.
Jesus. Blessed be thy name, Lord Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Be exalted over God, above the heavens. Let thy glory your holy name Jesus Lord we know Lord that you alone are our rock and our fortress Lord Jesus master to whom can we go you have the words of life Lord Jesus you said my sheep hear my voice and they follow me Lord today we come into your presence Lord that you the shepherd of our souls might speak to us Lord that the word of life that comes to us will enrich us, will empower us, will encourage us, Lord. And that your name would be lifted up in our lives as we learn from your example, Lord Jesus, as we learn from your word and from your life how we ought to live. For we know that apart from you, Lord Jesus, apart from your ways, apart from your word, we can never be blessed, Lord. Our lives are enriched only, only because you are in it, Lord. So we pray, Lord, speak to us today, Lord, from thy precious word. In Jesus' precious and holy name, I pray. Amen. Before we go to God's word this morning, I'd just like to make a few announcements. First of all, I'd like to thank you all for praying for Sandy and myself as we recover from COVID. The first test that we took was negative, but we had all the symptoms of COVID. So we took a second test uh, and a blood test and the second test came back positive. I want to thank all of you for your prayers and for your calls and messages and encouragement. Thank you so much. I'm feeling a little much better now, except uh, my throat you may have noticed as I led, uh, as I sang that uh, my throat is still giving me trouble, but nevertheless, uh, we'll still praise and worship the Lord no matter what. Uh, I'd like to say that I'm so happy that we received a good response to the, the prayer at, at night, uh, at nine o'clock. Uh, two weeks ago, we started praying at nine o'clock, all of us as a church at uh, Psalm 46. And in fact, the, the response was so good. We decided to, I decided to continue for another week in, with Psalm 96. And so I've been receiving wonderful reports. Some families have called in and said they were not praying earlier. Uh, their family prayers and now they all wait for nine, uh, for nine o'clock so they can gather together and pray together as a family. And um, many have told me that they've also set alarms on their on their phones at nine o'clock uh, some families have told me that they're excited even before nine o'clock they all sit down <clears throat> they all sit down and uh, you know gather together waiting for nine o'clock where we can all pray together and it's such a lovely sense of of uh, what should i say just a nice thought to know that that all of us together even though we're not able to meet or even see each other that at least we're all able to to pray together and that's a wonderful thought to know that 
all the members of Hope Chapel are uniting together like this. And so uh, at the end of this week, Saturday will be the, or Sunday will be the, Saturday will be the last day of praying Psalm 96. But I hope that this, this habit will continue in every family, that you will gather every night to pray. And I would urge you and encourage you to go through God's Word. There are so many wonderful prayers in the Word of God where you can pray together as a family from God's Word and then uh, individually for whatever else you want to and need to pray for. I'd like to say also thank you so much as a congregation. I've always said this, that uh, you have been such givers as a congregation with no compulsion or force. Uh, I want to thank you all for your faithful giving. It's now nearly a year and a half since we've all uh, been through this COVID crisis and even though church hasn't been open at all except for a few weeks in between, uh, still all of you have been so faithful in your giving to the Lord. And I'd like to give glory to the Lord as I say this, that we have been able to pay all our bills. We've not defaulted on any. And all the programs that we have, like helping the elderly with money to, to buy their tablets each month, we've been able to continue that to all the elderly people that we support. We've been able to continue to buy rations for the poor and, and get it across to them. Uh, you know, we've made a deal with, with one of the stores and we, of course, he, we deal regularly with him and he packs all the stuff and keeps it. And, and whenever there's a lull in the, the lockdown, uh, people, the poor, are going to the shop and collecting their food rations for the month. Uh, also, there have been cases when some people have gone into hospital and, of course, as we know, the COVID treatment is sky high. The cost of beds in hospitals has been so much. And of course, we've not been able to pay the whole bill, but we've reached out to many people and helped them in, in some way financially towards the payment of their bills. Uh, also, we've been able to reach out and help in some degree with money to those who've lost jobs. And so I praise God that even though, when, even though it's been a tough time, the kingdom of God marches on and marches forward. And uh, we never have to worry the Bible teaches us that God is faithful and He provides. And I, I speak a blessing upon your lives today, Hope Chapel. Every member, may the Lord richly bless you as He, he opens the windows of heaven and pours out blessing upon you. you. You've just given so generously. Thank you so much. May the Lord richly bless you in return. Because I can't tell you what it means to, to watch, to reach out to those who are desperate and who have no money, many of them no food, but we've been able to, for, for some of the poor who don't have smartphones, uh, we are not able to, to transfer money to them. But what we've done is we've contacted relatives of theirs and, and, and they, he made an agreement to transfer the money to them and they've withdrawn the cash and give it to them and given it to them. Uh, some uh, have called in who are not on our regular list and said we don't have food. So what we've done is we've told them you go to a store, local store, call the man, and uh, we'll, we'll tell him to give you food rations and then we've paid online directly to that store. And so God's made wonderful ways for us to reach out, but I can't tell you, it wouldn't have been possible if it were not for your love. Uh, my precious members, thank you so much for your love because we're able to show the love of Jesus to those who don't have and who are desperate, who have no money. And uh, it's just it just feels so wonderful to be able to do that. Thank you and may the Lord bless you. I also, I'd like to tell you that we are slowly getting more into into social media because of the lockdown. It's actually uh, taught us a lot more. And as you can see, I'm recording this message from uh, our home. And uh, I know the last two weeks I was right up in your face. I was also during that time I had uh, all the symptoms of COVID, the body pain and the throat pain and, and all the other symptoms. And uh, you know, but today you you may notice I'm, I'm a little away from the laptop and this is just a stock laptop through which I'm doing the recording and uh, <clears throat> learning as we go along. So we are on, we are now on Instagram and we are, we are at hopeministries.in, I-N. It's one word, all lowercase. So if you want to find us on Instagram, it's hope ministries, one word, no gap hopeministries.in. So please log in and follow us. At the outset, there may, may not be too many posts because we're just learning the ropes. Uh, but in the future, we'll continue to update 
uh, stream, a social stream, the Instagram stream, and 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 uh, you know account and and keep uh, keep you updated on a lot of things that are happening uh, in church. So thank you once again, all of you. Uh, I'm waiting for that day when the choir will be able to get back and and lead us in praise and worship. You know, for the few weeks that the choir was able to. We were able to meet with social distancing in church and the choir was leading us. It was wonderful to see a whole choir, all the musicians and the singers. It was so wonderful. And just as we were getting into it, the second lockdown happened. Or oh, I don't know, maybe the third or the fourth, but uh, I'm just waiting. So until then, you'll have to make do with uh, yours truly as a one-man band. But nevertheless, I'm, I'm grateful to the Lord that we're able to keep the sacrifice of praise burning and in, in going up to the Lord. Today I'd like to start uh, a new series on being strong. Especially during this time, as I talk to people, I recognize and realize that there's a lot of pressure and a lot of stress. A lot of people are going through so much in, in their lives today because of being locked away. Some are alone and don't know what to do. And so I've entitled this series, Be Strong. And when I talk about being strong, I'm talking about being strong on the inside because spiritual strength just doesn't come to us in some supernatural way. It's something growth happens uh, over a sequence of time. It doesn't happen overnight. It happens through things that we do and the disciplines that we apply in our lives. We can pray our way to spiritual growth and strength. And so I want to focus on the next few weeks about building up ourselves on the inside Prayer always prepares us for spiritual growth. And I pray and I sincerely hope that during this time of lockdown that you have been able to spend more time in prayer individually, not just as families, but also as individuals and uh, drawing closer to the Lord and building up yourself in your inner man, because that is what will hold us and keep us in, in the storms that come into our lives. And I'd like to read from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 to 20. Ephesians 1, 15 to 20. And I'm reading from the New Living Translation, this particular passage. Ever since I first heard of your strong faith in the Lord, in the Lord Jesus, and your love for God's people everywhere, I have not stopped thanking God for you. I pray for you constantly asking God, the glorious Father of our, of our Lord Jesus Christ, to give you spiritual wisdom and insight so that you may grow in your knowledge of God. That's a good prayer. I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can understand the confident hope that he has given to those he called, his holy people who are his rich and glorious inheritance. I also pray that you will understand the incredible greatness of God's power for us who believe him. This is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of God's right hand in the heavenly realms. What a beautiful prayer. Maybe this is a prayer that you can jot down, that you can pray for your loved ones and for yourself. Uh, at night after you finish praying Psalm 96 it can be an extension or maybe next week you can pray Ephesians 1 15 to 20 for those whom you love I'd like to read another passage of scripture before we proceed Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 onwards <clears throat> Ephesians chapter 3 verses 14 onwards and I'm reading from the Living Bible when I think of the wisdom and scope of his plan, I fall down on my knees and pray to the Father of all, the great family of God, some of them already in heaven and some down here on earth, that out of his glorious unlimited resources, he will give you the mighty inner strengthening of his Holy Spirit. And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand 
as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep, and how high His love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves, though it is so great that you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. And so at last you will be filled up with God Himself. Now glory be to God who by His mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we would ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts or hopes. May He be given glory forever and ever through endless ages because of His master plan of salvation for the Church through Jesus Christ. What a beautiful prayer. This was a prayer that Paul prayed for the churches that he wrote to, for the people that he looked after and that were under him. And these two passages of scripture, we can note down and make them a part of our regular prayer. One of the good things to do when we pray is to pray according to God's word. Or in other words, to pray God's word. Because all the promises in God's word, the Bible says are yes and amen for us. And when we pray God's word, and that's why as we pray Psalm, the Psalms these past two weeks, we are praying God's word and it will be answered. Paul was not only an apostle, but he had a pastor's heart as well. And there are seven points that I want to share with us today about spiritual growth in our lives. The first point is this, pray that we would know God better. I wonder if we've ever prayed that prayer, because a lot of times we're praying for external things, praying for a good job, to pay our bills, and there's nothing wrong with that. We're praying for good health and all of that. But how many times do we pray and say, Lord, I want to know you more. I want to know you more. So the first point is we need to pray, Lord, I want to know you more. And we'll see the reason why. The beginning point of our spiritual growth is, first of all, a deeper knowledge of God. Paul prayed that they would get to know God better. And there's a reason, because sometimes we can know about God, but not know God himself. And that's why when Jesus walked this earth, there was a time when they went into a village and the people said, get out from here, we don't want you. And the apostles were quite indignant. The disciples became quite indignant. And they said, Lord, I mean, look at these people. You've come here to, to bless them and they don't want you. So should we call fire down from, from heaven? And Jesus said, you don't know of what spirit you are. I came not to destroy, but to give life. The Pharisees, they studied the Bible. But when Jesus came, when they studied about God. But when God came in person, they didn't recognize him. And it can be that people will even say, I'm a Christian. But they don't know God. In fact, in the Bible, the Bible speaks of a parable of 10 virgins waiting for the groom to come. And it says five of them were wise. They had their lamps filled with oil and they were ready waiting for the groom. The other five were indifferent because the groom took long in coming. They didn't listen to, they didn't wait for the groom. So they became indifferent. They didn't really know God. And in fact, when the Pharisees, when Jesus confronted the Pharisees, he told them that they, they didn't know God. Imagine that. The Pharisees had to memorize the Bible and God told them, you are of your father, the devil. Those are strong words. They had all the religious makings, external mark, markings of religiosity. They had memorized the Bible, but they didn't know God. You can tell when people know God by their behavior. Our witness for Christ is not standing up and telling somebody, 
you know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, I gave my life to Jesus. Our witness for God is our everyday behavior. So our first prayer should be, Lord, help me know you better. So that in the outworkings of my life, I demonstrate who you are, not just in my words, but in the outworking of my personality, in the outworking of my very being people see Christ in me because that's what the Bible says Christ in you the hope of glory I want to challenge you to start praying in your life God father I want to know you better put this down as a prayer point Lord I want to know you better why is the knowledge of God so important it's because of this a limited knowledge of God results in a limited trust in God. If we don't know God's nature and character, we are not going to trust him. A limited trust in God is going to result in limited obedience to God. You know, sometimes fathers put their children up on a, on a, on a wall or, a, or, a, or a high, in a high place and say, jump. And the children are nervous at the edge saying, no, dad, I don't want to jump. And the father says, jump, trust me, I'll catch you. And after much convincing, they leap off that edge. But why do they do that? Because they come to a point where they are trusting their father to catch them as they fall. And some of the things that God may ask us to do are not easy. Like forgiving. Like giving. Even when we don't have. Or loving somebody that's unlovable. It's difficult to do. But when you know how God operates, you don't look at a situation or people the way it's normally done. You look through the eyes of Jesus. You work with the heart of God. And in this world, we, we need more people who, not just, who don't just know God, know about God, but who know Him and behave the way He does. A limited trust in God is going to result in a limited obedience to God. Because our main problem is not an obedience problem, it is a trust problem. A limited obedience will also result in limited blessing in our lives. And so we must not only trust, we must also obey. If we want more blessings in our life, then we have to learn to obey Him more. The second point I want to share is pray that we will accept God's plan for our lives. Because sometimes, you know, we say, Lord, not my will be done, but let yours. But we go ahead and, and do what we want. And God may spe be speaking to us and say, Noah, that's not how I want you to live. This is what I want you to do. So the second point, if we want to be strong on the inside, and remember, this is what we're talking about, how to be strong in our faith. It's easy to quote scripture when everything is going well. But when we are at our lowest, can we still stand tall? Can we still stand strong? Can we be immovable through those storms? The Bible talks of a parable where there are two men who built their houses. One built their house on the rock and the other built his house on the sand. And the storms came. The one that built his house on the rock that house stood the gale force winds. That house stood the storm. It's because it's an indication of the relationship, the foundation that that person had in God himself. And so if we are to remain strong and come up victoriously through whatever situation we are in our lives right now, or even in that we could be in the future, we must pray, Lord, give me the grace to accept your plan for my life. And, and mind you, if something is not working out, no matter what you've been trying, time and time again, trying this to do the same thing and it's not been working out, it could be that God's saying, listen, this is not my plan for your life. So start to think about a different angle or do something different, something else. Because this is not my will. It's not working out. If you're willing to sit and listen and I am able to speak to you, then 
you can move forward because now you're willing to accept my will. So we must train in our plans for God's plans. Spiritual growth or inner strength really happens when we let go of our plans and embrace God's plan for our lives. Building our lives around God's plans will give us more hope in our lives. When we try to build our lives, you know, based on our plans, we will soon run out of hope. But if God has said and given us a vision for something, we can hold to that path, even though it may be narrow and difficult, because God will come through every time. It gives us hope. When we choose God's plan for our lives, then there is an unlimited supply of hope for our future. Jeremiah 29, 11 says, God says, for I know the plans that I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you, plans to give you hope and a future. Now, even in difficult times, when we have that inner strength to accept God's plan in our lives, in the most difficult times, we will see the blessings of God. Take, for example, Joseph. He was sold by his brothers. He was falsely accused. He was put in prison. But you know what? Wherever he went, God's favor surrounded him. You know why? Because even during those adverse circumstances, he was in the midst of God's plan for his life. We know that because in the end, we see the attitude that he had. How is it that at the end of his life, when he first met his brothers who had sold him as a slave, he was able to love them and tell them what you meant for evil, God turned it out for good. You know why? He knew God. His brothers were of the same faith as him, but they didn't, because they didn't know God, they, they sold their own brother into slavery. So Joseph had God's favor upon his life. And I'm telling you right now, today, wherever you are, you may say, how can I have hope in this situation? Listen, if you come to that point where you say, Lord, I don't understand why I'm going through this, but I, I still want to have a grateful heart. I still want to draw nearer to you. I want to discover what your will is for my life in this time of my life. Tell you what, when that acceptance rises up to God, his favor will come down. His favor will come down. Paul, wherever, wherever he went, we, found, we find in God's word that there were many occasions, many times when the, the chief, you know, guard or the chief jailer, you know, showed Paul favor in a prison. God's favor surrounded Paul. Hope is the vehicle that transports us into the future. So when you say, God, I'll accept your will, Father. If this is your will for my life, I accept it, Lord. It will transport you to the future. In a way, it's like a time machine. It takes us to that place and we are at rest in that journey. It takes us to that place where we just lean on God and trust in Him. In Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 8, the Living Bible, this is the Living Bible version, says this, I pray that your hearts will be flooded with light so that you can see something of the future he has called you to share. I want you to realize that God has been made rich because we who are Christ's have been given to him. Oh, that's so beautiful. Listen, God's life has been enriched because through Christ, when we receive Jesus into our heart as, as our Lord and Savior, we have enriched God's life. Now, some of you are saying, oh, I don't know how I can enrich God's life because you don't know who I am and what I am, the things I've done. But let me tell you today, if you were anything less than a sinner, you would never enrich God's life. Because you are a sinner, you enrich God's life. I'll tell you why. A sinner is one who acknowledges there, who goes to God and say, like we are doing today, Lord, I want to know you more. Lord, I don't want my will, my way, my plans. I want your plans. That's what makes God happy. 
He wants such people to come to him, to lean on him. Why did God create, create us? He created us so that he, we would have a relationship with him and enjoy. He would enjoy watching us being blessed. I tell you something. You know, when we have close friends, loved ones, when they do well, we rejoice with them. We're happy for them. We want to be with them. We want to, you know, we want to shout and jump for joy when something good happens in their lives. And I tell you something, when you know God, you will recognize that through all of this, through all our failures, through all our falling, we enrich God's life. Not because we do the wrong, but because we acknowledge that we are sinners and we need Him. And God's heart and nature is such that He's waiting to reach out. But sometimes, like the Pharisees, they said, Ah, I'm better than that person. I don't need to be like Him. I pray, I read my Bible, I go to church, I give my tithes. And the Bible says that God did not, he did not please God. He didn't go home justified. It was the man who beat his chest and he said, Lord, can I enrich your life? Today, think about this. You enrich God's life just as you are. You know, I've heard people say, I don't know why I do the things I do. I can't break free from this addiction. Jesus died for you. Jesus came for you. And as you continue to lean on him, he will come through for you. He will come through for you. And for the times when you fail, don't think, oh, I failed him. He still comes after that one sheep. He still follows his own. And wherever you are in your life today, I want to encourage you you enrich God's life right now, sinner as you are. You enrich God's life. Wow. You know, it's, it's such a wonderful, it's such a joy to know that I enrich God's life rather than somebody telling me you're going to hell. And I want to say to you today, if you're a child of God and you receive Jesus into your heart and you've repented of your sins, and you seek to follow God with all your heart. There are times when you stumble and you fall, but that's okay, you get up and you continue that journey. I want to say to you, you enrich God's life. That's so beautiful. I pray that you'll always carry this with you throughout life, that you enrich God's life. Wow. God wants us to grab onto that fact that he has a phenomenal future for us. It's better that we have God's plan for our lives than to have our own plans because God's plan will give us a good future. Now, if we sincerely go before God and say, Lord, let your will be done, let your plan be done, then he will show us his plan. But sometimes people say that, but they already know what they want to do. God cannot move in such a person's life. He can't reach such a person. Because sometimes people just say the words, Lord, no, no, I want to do this. If you tell me, give it away, I'll give it away. And then when God says, give it away, they say, Lord, are you speaking to me or somebody else? Say, I'll give it, I'll give, give it all away, Lord. And then God says, yeah, I want you to give it away. And you say, Lord, um, not today. Can I give it tomorrow? It's better that we have God's plan for our lives. And may I remind us that not always will God's plan really make us jump for joy. Not always. Are we prepared to still love him? Even if it means that it's not going to be pleasant or it's going to be difficult. When God puts hope in our heart, it will do some wonderful things for us. And I pray that when we have that hope that God's plan is always better for us, we'll be happy. We'll be happy. The third point, pray that we will learn God's promises. Spiritual growth cannot happen without the right resources in our lives. One of the resources that we need to receive and understand 
are the promises of God that are found in the Bible. There are three th primary things regarding the Word of God and they are precepts, principles and promises. The precepts are the laws of God. Thou shalt and thou shalt not. The commandments of God. There are certain things that God says we can do and certain things that we ought not to do. Those are the precepts. And then we have the principles from God's Word. And this is how uh, these principles, this is how God designed us to live to live by certain standards. And the third is the promises. We need to know the promises if we are going to claim the promises. We not only need to know God's promises in our minds, but also in our hearts. And that's why when we pray, it's always good to remind God, Lord, you said this, you remember? You know, when the children were growing up sometimes, you know, I would tell the kids, if you study well, and, and we, as parents, we all do this. If you study well, then, you know, this uh, this coming weekend, if you get a good results in your test, I'm going to give you something. I'm going to buy you ice cream this, this coming, this coming weekend. And the children hardly finish their test even before getting the results. They come back and say, I did my test. I say, no, no, I'm waiting for the results. No, no, but you said, you said you'll buy me ice cream. And you know, what do they, they, they bring us back to the promise that we made. And we will always be children to God. We will always be children to God, my friends. We never grow up in His sight. That's why you and I today are referred to as the children of God. And so His promises are something that we go before Him and say, Father, you said that, you said this, didn't you? And then, you know, I'm just leaning on that. I'm going to trust in you, Lord. Promises are like arrows which we need to put into our quiver. When we face a spiritual battle, we can reach into the quiver of our spiritual life and fire those promises into the future. They will make a way for us because those promises are of God. The fourth point. The fourth point. <clears throat> Pray that we will develop spiritual grit or a determination. These are prayer points. These seven points that I'm sharing with you, write them down as prayer points for yourself. Most of the time we pray for others, which is good. But I want you to write down these points. Grit, it means to have firmness, firmness of character, an indomitable spirit, not easily shaken or inner strength. So when, when we are battered and bruised and, and the tendency is to be hurt and to, and to be depressed and down, we stand up with a grit and a determination that does not an inner strength, that does not allow us to crumble on the inside, but a, 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 a determination, a grit to stand our ground and to take every, every square inch that God has ordained for us. That's what God told to, said to Joshua. Every place that you set your foot upon, I will give to you. So we must take ground for God. And unless we know and hope and, and trust His ways, we're never going to do that. So I want to encourage you, whatever you're going through today, be determined. Say, if anything has to happen, let it happen. But I will trust in God. And I know there have been many who've lost loved ones. There's no words that I can say because of COVID, many have lost loved ones. There's no words that I can say to you that can bring you comfort. But I want to encourage you to nestle in the arms of God. And how do you do that? The Bible says underneath are his everlasting arms. How do you nestle? You know, Cory ten Boom said, don't wrestle, but nestle. How do you nestle in those everlasting arms? As you read his word. God is holding you in his arms and speaking his strength into your life. That's who God is. He holds you in his arms and he says, my beloved, I will speak. As you read his word, he's speaking to you. And for those of you who've lost loved ones, God knows your pain. And in the days that lie ahead, he will show you that he is with you, even though your loved one may not be with you. God will show you in, in magnified ways 
that he is multiplied ways that he is with you and you'll marvel and you'll say lord i know i'm not alone because you are forever faithful when i say determination for and have grit don't be afraid challenge you know the devil some of you are sick and say you're going to die don't live in fear even if we if it's god's time for us to die we will not die with fear we will be courageous we will face death we must have a determination and a grit when nothing causes us to be afraid because we're strengthened by god himself on the inside so don't be afraid to die yes we're not i'm not saying this with bravado or with with any sense of uh pomp and show but i say this with a confidence because you know something when we breathe out you know what the bible says god breathed into adam and he became a living being that same breath that god breathed into us the moment we came into being in our mother's womb that same breath is what we exist on today when it comes for us to die our time to die we breathe that breath goes out but you know something we exhale when we die but the next inhalation is in the presence of god that's why paul said for me to live is christ but to die is gain so if you take away the fear of death then we're in a good place for those of you who are living in fear of death today have a determination and a grit when you know god you can have that determination and grit cuz i'm not afraid to die because we can die only when god says it's time how do i know that because the bible says when jesus died on the cross and descended into hell he snatched the keys of death and hell from satan and he determines today who dies and who doesn't of his children and otherwise so he has the keys of death so i want to encourage you i know we are surrounded by so much of death in covid but don't die before you die there are many people who die before they die you know why they you know some people you've heard people say i'm dying with fear that's true they die before they die so i want to encourage you we trust god we take all the precautions we isolate ourselves we take our medication during this time of covid we don't step out with bravado and say you know i don't need masks and who believes in in vaccinations and medication and all of that foolishness there have been so many people who have spoken like that and have died no we take our medication and i want to encourage you again take the vaccination but we will not be ruled by fear and that's why i tell you even though i've had covid in these past two sundays and this is the third sunday when i'm i'm leading i said even if I have a hundred plus temperature, whatever. I will still stand up and I'll serve God and I will preach His word, no matter what happens. We must have determination. I want to encourage you. Don't be afraid. Don't be afraid. In Ephesians chapter three and verse sixteen, I pray that from His glorious unlimited resources. he will empower you with inner strength through his spirit we live in a world that generally does not honor god if we're going to stand strong in a world that is not oriented towards christ we need spiritual grit if we are not strong on the inside then when trouble comes then it will shake us up sometimes people lose their faith in times of it- of adversity and i pray that your faith is not shaken during this difficult time hold on to god this is your time to prove to god your faith in him not by saying where is god in all of this 
that by saying, God, I don't understand, not my will be done. Jesus held that cup in his hand and he said, Father, this cup, take it from me. Let not my will be done, but yours. And he said to his disciples, this cup, which my father has given me, shall I not drink it? You know what? He saw that cup of suffering as coming from the very hands of the father that he trusted. His father that he trusted. Can you and I also say, when we go through difficulties, shall I not drink of this cup that my father has given to me? I want to encourage you. Have that. Don't lose faith in God because you're going through what you are today. Now is the time to prove your faith to God. The fifth point. Pray that you and I will give more of our lives to the Lord. Because a significant part of our growth is dependent on how much of our lives we give to Christ. Now I know there are religious people who say we need to give all our lives and, and the question is, is how we may say we know we need to give all of our lives but in reality how much do we really give? So I'm not going there at all. You and I need to recognize that we need to give certain areas of our life over to God. Because we all have a variety of dim dimensions to our life. We are spirit, soul and body. And when we are born again, Jesus gave life to our spirit. But just because Jesus lives within us, it does not mean that he has control over every part of our lives. And maybe through this message, the Holy Spirit will speak to you and indicate to you maybe the area of your life that you need to give to God. The area that is not submitted to God. Lord, not my plan, but your plan. Because we still have our own minds, our wills and our emotions. Jesus wants to affect, affect us in all dimensions of our lives. He wants to change the way we think and make decisions. He wants to change the way we feel, the way we look at things, what we listen to and how we speak. God wants to change us. Spiritual growth is all about letting Jesus control these areas of our lives and more. We need to learn to give Jesus control over all the areas of our lives and it just doesn't come. There's no blanket, uh, you know, miracle like that that happens. Yes, we are saved, but there's a process that continues. But over uh, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, we we'll learn to submit more areas of our life to the Lord as we learn from his word and God speaks to us and we understand some of the things that we need to change in our lives. Ephesians 3.17 says, And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts. In other words, that those areas of our hearts that are not fully submitted to God, we need to bring under the subjection of the Holy Spirit. The sixth point, we need to pray that we would learn to share God's love. Spiritual growth requires growth in love as well. In 1 John 4, 8, the Bible says, whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. Now, I know some people say, yeah, yeah, I love them as long as they are far away. I love them as long as they are there and I am here. But spiritual growth requires love. You know, when Jesus hung on the cross, the same people who crucified him stood at the bottom of the cross you'd think that they would at least offer a man who was dying the dignity of not cursing him while he died. And yet, Jesus wasn't even afforded that. While he hung on the cross, they mocked him, the Bible says. Wow. What kind of hearts do men have? I'll tell you why. Because they don't know God. They said to him, can you imagine Jesus had the nails in his hands, the nails in his feet. His side had been pierced. He had been beaten without sleep. He, they had whipped his back to smithereens. Everyone had abandoned him. He hangs in pain on the cross, unable to breathe, gasping for breath and still those sinners were on his mind. 
because he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. I'll tell you when you know that you have God's love, when you can love those who don't love you. That's when you have God's love. If we are to grow in godliness, we have to grow in love. The Pharisees thought that memorizing the Bible and praying 10 times a day and giving their money to God was sufficient. But God told them they were not even believers. It's love that defines our Christianity, not our knowledge. We have to, but we have to experience God's love on the inside to be able to show it on the outside. And unless we know God in that intimate way, we don't know how he loves. But when we know him closely, we can love like he did. The reason why people don't often show love to others is because they haven't experienced God's love themselves. This picture that they've had of God is God is waiting to punish you. I'm telling you today, sinner as you are, sinner as I am, we enrich God's life. Because you know what Jesus said to the Pharisees? He said, I didn't come for the righteous. He said, but I came for the sinner. He didn't come for the righteous because the Pharisees said, no, we are not wrong. We did everything right. We're not like the other people. Look at us. We pray, we go to church, we don't do the things they do. No, 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 no. Jesus said he didn't come for people like that. He came for sinners. He said, I didn't come for the righteous. The self-righteous don't know God. You enrich God's life. This very moment, you enrich God's life. No matter what your past is, no matter what your present is, God still stands at the door of your heart and he knocks. He says, listen, I want to talk to you. I have a good plan for you. Let me in, into that area of your life. So unless we know God, and the Bible tells us that God is love. God is love. It's not the other way around. Love is God. You know, if we find on, on auto rickshaws behind painted, love is God. No, no, no. That's not biblical. It's the other way around. God is love. And the reason why people don't often show love is because they haven't experienced God's love themselves. They don't know God. We cannot give what we don't have. We need to pray, Lord, help me understand how much you love me. You want more love in your heart? Pray this prayer. Lord, help me understand how much you love me. When we pray that, God will give us an understanding of the length and breadth and depth and height of love. You know what the Bible says? Nothing can separate us from the love of God. No demon, no light, no darkness, no, no demon, no angel, no light, no darkness, no height, no depth can separate us from the love of Christ, love of God, which is in Christ Jesus. Immeasurable. And unless we know him personally, not as somebody that we meet on Sunday in church, but every day of our lives in intimacy, in the intimacy of prayer and seeking his face, we need to pray, Lord, help me understand you, Lord, help me understand your love. The greatest love that we will ever receive is the love of God. The love of God will change us and soften up the hard areas of our lives. Paul was Saul before he was Paul. When he meets the love of God on the road to Damascus, his life was transformed. Paul was a Pharisee of Pharisees, but he wasn't saved. There are Christians today who know the Bible but are not saved. Our lives are demonstrated through love. Our faith is demonstrated through love. Ephesians 3, 17 to 18 says, And I pray that Christ will be more and more at home in your hearts, living within you as you trust in him. May your roots go down deep into the soil of God's marvelous love. And may you be able to feel and understand as all God's children should, how long, how wide, how deep and how high is his love. His love really is. And to experience this love for yourselves, though it is so great that you will never see the end of it or fully know or understand it. And so at last, you will be filled up with God himself. The seventh and the final point. We must pray 
that we will learn to trust God's power in our lives. The battle is not ours, it's God's. He will take care of it. God's power is an awesome power. That's an understatement. I don't have to say that. Nothing is impossible for him. There is a direct connection between our prayer life and spiritual power. A prayerless life will be a powerless life. I pray that by the end of this message, that as the Holy Spirit ministers to you, that you will be more determined than ever to have a life of prayer. A prayerful life will become a powerful life. Remember, we're talking about how to be strong in this life, to be determined, to walk with grit, to not turn back, to not lose hope, to not lose faith in God. God can only accomplish what he wants to in our lives through his power that is at work in our lives. Ephesians 1, 19 to 20 says, I pray that you will begin to understand how incredibly great his power is to help those who believe him. It is the same mighty power that raised Christ from the dead and seated him in the place of honor at God's right hand in heaven. The reality of every believer is this. The power of God dwells in us through the Holy Spirit. And it's that same power that raised Jesus from the dead. The resurrection power of God is in you and me. But in order for us to be strong on the inside and experience it, what I've shared, it's not, it's not exhaustive in itself. But what I've shared will give you an idea from God's word of how necessary it is if we are to be strong on the inside. These are the things that we need to follow in our lives. Ephesians 3.20 3 says, Now glory be to God who by his mighty power at work within us is able to do far more than we could ever dare to ask or even dream of, infinitely beyond our highest prayers, desires, thoughts or hopes. Imagine that. Far beyond what you can pray, far beyond what you can imagine, God can do in our lives. But you must know him first for who he is. Only then you can trust him. Only then you'll be obedient. Only then you'll have hope for the future. Only then you'll trust him enough to say, not my plan, but your plan. Whatever it is, I'll accept it. It is God's will to answer these kind of prayers. And I pray that you make a note of these seven points that I've shared with you today as prayers for yourself together with the scriptures that I've shared today. And I pray that you keep this as a list of, of points to pray for yourself, that you may be made strong on the inside. Let's close in prayer. Now may the Lord our God bless you and keep you. The Lord make his holy face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his holy countenance upon you and give you peace. And may the love of God our Father, the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and the sweet fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with us now in the coming week and for always I pray in his name that is above every other name. In Jesus precious and holy name I pray. Amen and Amen. God bless you. Have a wonderful week. And remember, right now at this moment, you are enriching God's life. God bless you.